Assalamu alaikum. Inshallah, today we will start in a monocular elevation deficiency according to some request of some students. Inshallah. Uh, sign yes, please read from Kansky. Then we will go for uh, a PDF lecture for more detail. Yes. Monocular elevation deficiency, formerly double elevator palsy, is a rare sporadic condition that in at least some cases may be categorized as a CCDD. It is thought to manifest primarily with a tired or contracted inferior rectus muscle or a hypoplasic or ineffective superior rectus muscle. There is a profound inability to elevate one eye across the horizontal plane from abduction to adduction, with orthophoria in the primary position in about one third of cases. Chin elevation may be present. A base up breeze can be helpful. Okay, so let me explain it in a simple way here. Here, there's just they talk about the definition. In the past, the previous name for it, it's double elevator palsy. What does that mean, double elevator palsy? Uh, the two muscles that elevate the eye, there is a problem in it. And what are our two elevator muscles? Superior rectus muscles and the inferior oblique muscles. They are responsible for elevation of the eye. So there is a problem in both of them or one of them. In, in the previous, they said it's double elevator palsy. Uh, here they said is a rare sporadic condition that in at least some cases may be categorized as uh, congenital cranial disinnervation disability. These are multiple diseases, the CCD disease, the congenital cranial disinnervation disability, one of them the monocular elevation deficiency because there is abnormality in, in the connection of these cranial nerves. Here, mostly they talk about the uh, connection that related to oculomotor nerve. It's thought to manifest the primary with tight or contracted inferior rectus muscles or hypoplastic or, or ineffective severe rectus muscles. Here, in American Academy, they divide it like two, three types, okay? Type no number one, like there is inferior rectus restriction. So due to this inferior rectus restriction, like it doesn't go up. Number two, there is superior rectus palsy, okay, and or monoocular or supranuclear palsy, superior rectus palsy or supranuclear palsy. We will talk about the differentiate between them. And number three, our uh, type three is combined mechanism. Combined mechanism, there is inferior rectus restriction and superior rectus palsy or with supranuclear palsy. We will talk about all of this detail in the lecture, just this is a definition about it. But the main problem here, they, they, they mention it here, there is a problem in elevation on one eye across the horizontal plane. So the eye, look at, let us look at the picture, uh, the picture here. This is right eye monocular elevation deficiency. Here the eye in the horizontal plane, okay, in picture A, so he look just up and the eye can't look up, and he, here in adduction, or in, in this way, and here just up, and the eye still in the horizontal plane or in the primary position can't look up, and also in the abduction and up, the eye look up in this way, so it is still, there is no looking up. So at upward and upward in adduction, and upward in ad abduction, the eye is still present in the horizontal plane, all of the stages it can't go up at all when you see this number one you should think about monocular elevation deficiency okay so there is limitation in all of the cases in upward movement this is the definition okay from abduction upward to adduction upward with orthophoria in a primary position mostly straight in primary position uh, in about one third of the cases. The shin elevation may be present. Always movement of the shin, it go to the area that I can't go toward it. There is a problem in upward movement, so your shin or your head, it will go to upward as compensatory mechanism. You can't look down 
your head it will lock down okay uh, shin depression like in uh, like in supranuclear like in fourth near palsy the eye can't go to the reading position so your shin it will go down when the eye can't go up your shin it will go up this is the point so your head always make a compensatory mechanism to the place that i the eyes can't go to it very in as in this simple way okay base up prism can be helpful how base up prism it will be work this is the base up a prism like this okay so always put the apex toward the area of the deviation here in this patient mostly they have hypotropia hypotropia the eye in downward position so put the apex in the downward position and the base of the prism in the upward position this will maybe help sometimes but actually mostly we will go for surgical correction this is just an introduction for the lecture let us go to the detail of it so this is monocular elevation uh, policy we will start from here can you sign a read is it clear the first Monaco. part yes okay. it's clear yes please Monocular elevation deficiency is a limitation of elevation of the affected eye that is similar in both adduction and abduction. It is one of the causes of hypertropia and can be associated with ptosis, pseudoptosis. Yeah, this is this is very important. So one of the causes of hypertropia, the eye can go up. So sometimes you will see the eye it's in hypertropic position. This eye is 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 here at this place this eye here at like this place hypotropic eye just in a simple way when we say ptosis how to differentiate between ptosis and pseudotosis ptosis that mean true ptosis okay pseudotosis that mean it's not a true ptosis and ptosis it occur in these cases in 30 percent of the cases other work they write it 20 percent pseudotosis more common so it reached 70 percent of the cases so it's very easy to differentiate between doses and pseudotosis by cover and cover test cover and and cover test okay how we differentiate by cover and cover test when you put your hand or the cover on the eye with doses okay you cover it okay then you remove the cover to the other eye if it's a true doses the doses it will still present mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. But if it's pseudotosis, it will disappear by cover and cover test. Okay, this is very important for any patient with doses. Make cover and cover test. If the pseudotosis it's disappear and it's relieved during the covering and cover test, that means this is pseudotosis, not atrotosis. Okay. Okay, so what is the etiology? I will explain it from here. Maybe it's congenital or acquired. Uh, congenital cases, it's a sporadic, it's a sporadic. Okay, but the cause is that it's acquired. We will talk about it in the next slide. But here they di di differentiate it into three types. The inferior rectus, re rectus restriction, this is type one. Supranuclear palsy or primary superior rectus paresis, this is type two. And type 3 is combined between both of them. The acquired causes may be due to trauma, trauma to inferior rectus muscle, the superior rectus muscle, there is cerebrovascular disease, there is interruption in the vascularization, hypertension or thromboembolism, there is sarcoidosis that lead to inflammation that will lead to superior rectus palsy later on. Or syphilis or any tumor like pinocytoma, acoustic neuroma, and metastasis diseases. These are the acquired causes. Now let us talk about the general pathology. Yes, Sina, can you read? There are generally thought to be through the inferior rectus restriction, deficient elevation of the elevator muscles, or a combination of restriction and elevator deficit. In type 1, the etiology 
psychiatry is inferior rectus restriction, and those include patients with primary inferior rectus restriction or fibrosis. Force duction test demonstrates a tight inferior rectus. The upward saccades are usually normal until the tight inferior rectal limits up case. Bell's phenomenon is usually poor. Yeah, this is this is very important how to differentiate between the type one, type two, and type three. So they start with type one, as we said, is inferior rectus restriction. And this restriction in the, the, the inferior rectus, there is many causes of it. One of them may be trauma. Maybe it's just a sporadic congenital fibrosis around the inferior rectus that lead to restriction in the muscle. Sometimes we call it secondary inferior rectus restriction. What's that mean, secondary, not a primary? If it's secondary, that means after long standing of superior rectus palsy, this long standing of superior rectus palsy, it will end with inferior rectus restriction because just the inferior rectus it just work work and there is no any movement upward so later on it be restricted and somehow longest in standing severe rectus policy it will end with secondary inferior rectus restriction uh, and thus include patient with a primary inferior rectus restriction or fibrosis of the muscle what is the force duction test and we will differentiate today between the generated duction test and the force duction test. Force duction test, first of all, it should be under local anesthesia, okay? And you just go under anesthesia. Here, this is the eye and another eye. And here you should catch, you should make it for vertical movement and for horizontal movement. If we want to see the vertical movement of the eye, you come with your forceps here at the medial side and the lateral side of the limbus at a three at nine o'clock. And with your forceps, you elevate the eye. So you make a forced movement, okay? Mostly we did this test under general anesthesia. So you elevate the eye with your forceps, then you depress the eye with your forceps from at three nine, three at nine o'clock. This is to see the vertical movement and the opposite at 12 and 6, you can see the horizontal movement. Move it right and move it left. This test, it will help you to detect if there is any inferior rectus restriction. When you elevate the eye upward, the eye, it will not go upward with you because the inferior rectus, it catch the eye, catch the eye and it will not go with you upward. And sometimes they make a, a great system for how much the eye it go upward, okay? This help us to decide the inferior rectus recession, how much, six millimeter, seven millimeter, depend how much the eye it go upward, okay? So this is the force duction test. This is very important, the type one, and to differentiate it between type two and type three. So in force duction test, you will see tightening of inferior rectus, the eye it will not go upward. Uh, another thing, the saccade movement. The saccade movement in the type 1, usually it's normal. If it's not normal, it's slow. Until the tide inferior rectus limit the upgaze. So the saccade, you tell him to look upward. You put your finger in upward position. Look at my finger, his eye, it will go up until it limited at some way or at a, a, a point when the inferior rectus is limit the upgaze. And here the Bell's phenomena is usually poor. The only type there is Bell's phenomena, they are intact. This is a supranuclear palsy. So how to differentiate in supranuclear palsy? There is intact Bell's phenomena. Now we will talk about Bell's phenomena. But in the type 1 inferior rectus restriction, it's poor Bell phenomena. And also in the severe rectus palsy, it's poor. In the supranuclear palsy, it's intact. And for the action test here, it's positive. Okay, I hope it's easy for you, but uh, we will explain these things more and more, again and again, until you understand it. Yes, please continue. 
In type 2, the etiology is deficient in the relation of the elevator muscle, and those include primary superior rectus palsy. Feed is free and upper saccades are slow, both below and above midline. Bell's phenomenon is usually absent. Yes, so here, in type Yeah, so here in type two when we said type two they talk about supra here superior rectus palsy here according to this classification. So there is deficient not full it's deficient in the innervation. This is why the saccadic movement it is still present. Saccadic movement, it's not absent, it's slow. So he can a little bit look up, a little bit look down. So the elevation mechanism, okay, for upward and downward, it is still, the vertical gaze is still work, but there is deficient decrease in the innervation for superior rectus or for the inferior oblique. So this is superior rectus pulse, okay, mostly, the crosses here, they mention severe rectus palsy. The force duction test here, it's normal, free. If you move the eye upward or downward, there is no restriction. Under general anesthesia, you make this movement. And here, the saccadic movement are slow. It's not absent. Okay, below and above the midline. If you put the midline, the horizontal gaze, above and it, it is slow. But in the severe nuclear type, it's different. The saccadic movement, and for the Bell's phenomena, this is how we differentiate. Here, Bell's phenomena, it's absent. Bell's phenomena, uh, just I will put a video from YouTube how you can examine it. Just in very simple, you tell the patient to close his eye and you make a forced movement of a trying open his eye. So you make with your fun cap, open his eye and tell him to close his eye. And when you try to open it, you will see the eye, it's below the upper eye. It, the eye, it will move upward. This is like a, a reflex mechanism occur as afferent from the facial nerve and the efferent by the oculomotor nerve. This is just in a simple way. Type 3, read it, please. The etiology is a supranuclear type and is usually congenital. It is characterized by intact or mildly reduced vertical, vertical saccadic velocity below midline, but abnormal or absent velocity above midline. Fidelity is unlimited. Yes, force action test here also, it's unlimited or it's free. It's normal, that means supranuclear policy here they said mostly it's congenital and intact or mildly reduced the vertical saccade. So here how to differentiate between superior rectus palsy and the supranuclear palsy by the saccadic movement. Here there is a slow above and below the midline. Here if you put the midline, there is no movement above the midline at all. No any movement. But below the midline there is still movement. Okay. Here, reduce vertical saccade below the midline, but it's absent above the midline. Okay, so here the movement. We will now go for the pathophysiology of supranuclear policy, why it's seven in the other slides. Okay, yes. Okay. This, this uh, table, it's the conclusion of the courses. How to differentiate? Here, this is from Rosenbaum book. Okay, it's a very nice book especially for the people who like the strabismus. It will go for the detail of the details. Uh, I will put it in Shala in the description. For a primary superior rectus palsy, the superior rectus are weakness, a supranuclear elevation deficiency, also the superior rectus, there is weakness. Primary inferior rectus restriction or secondary inferior rectus restriction due to long standing of superior rectus palsy. Here, the superior rectus weakness it's negative but here secondary inferior rectus restriction it's positive because it's occur after long standing of severe rectus weakness this is why we call it secondary inferior rectus restriction okay so the only one negative is a primary inferior rectus restriction for inferior rectus restriction the only positive are the primary and the secondary type they have positive of the inferior rectus restriction now let us see the saccadic movement as we said 
its absence above midline in the supranuclear valsi. This is how we differentiate it between and between it and between the primary severe rectus valsi. It's still slow in the primary severe rectus valsi and the secondary inferior rectus obstruction. It's still slow because it's occur after long landing of primary severe rectus valsi. But it's intact, the saccadic movement in a primary inferior rectus restriction until the inferior rectus restriction. It's suddenly abrupt the movement by the restricted movement. So it will go until the inferior rectus make its restricted movement. Okay, not fully. Bell's phenomena as it's, it's negative in all of the type except in the superior uh, supranuclear palsy. It's here intact, normal Bell's phenomena. Force duction test, as we mentioned in the primary and secondary rectus, it's positive. In the palsy, it's negative. Okay. So, yes, please continue reading. Supranuclear mid, which is usually congenital, is characterized by intact or mildly reduced vertical saccadic level. Velocity below midline, but abnormal or absent velocity above midline. Monocular absence of vertical eye movements in superior field cell case and no resistance to upward rotation by force duction tests. Bell's phenomenon is present, indicating an intact oculomotor nerve, fasciculus, and nucleus. So just here, uh, a big revision for supranuclear policy, so it's mostly congenital. There is the use the vertical below the midline, but it's abnormal above the midline. This is very clear. Uh, no resistance, upward rotation by the force duction test, so it's negative. Mm -hmm. And Bell's phenomenon that there is intact in the oculomotor nerve cell, the fasciculus of the oculomotor nerve and the nucleus, then the fasciculus, then the oculomotor nerve. Near all of them are intact. Okay, so here this is the point about those phenomena. Okay, what is the pathophysiology of the supranuclear palsy? So I will go Wikipedia to go to more detail, but let me, before we go to the pathophysiology, let us just understand the thing about how the horizontal gaze its work. What is the vertical gaze? How is it work? Okay, so horizontal gaze. In any gaze, we have supranuclear. Okay, then the supranuclear order it will give the order to the nuclear system. Then the nuclear system it will give the order to the infranuclear system. This is how it work. The gaze, the horizontal gaze, and the vertical gaze. When we talk about the supranuclear, it comes from the frontal loop and the occipitoparietal loop, okay, for the horizontal saccadic movement. The frontal loop, this is the supranuclear, the frontal loop, what it gives you, it will lead to contralateral saccadic movement, okay, and the occipitoparietal loop, it's the responsible for ipsilateral pursuit movement. We will talk about this in a new thermology chapter in detail, inshallah. But here, this is how it's work. Here, they explain the horizontal gaze. So the horizontal gaze, the most important thing about it, is how the connection occur. We have the abducent nucleus, and this abducent nucleus, it will give you innervation. Look, number one here, two, the parapontine reticular formation. This is the most important part. Okay, this parapontine reticular formation, it's connected with the abducent nuclear. And this connection with the abducent nuclear, it will go to the opposite size of the medial lingotidinal fasciculus. So here the abducent nerve, it attach with this parapontine reticular formation at this side. And this Parapontine reticular formation, it will make connection with the medial lobitinal fasciculus in the other part. Why this is important? Here, if you understand how it's work, you can make the diagnosis very easily. So here, let us look at this left eye. So here, this is the abducent nucleus attached with the parapontine, and here, 
the parapod gene it's attached with the other next medial longitudinal fasciculus. The mean, uh, medial longitudinal fasciculus always is attached with the oculomotor nerve, and when it gives the innervation for looking at like here to the left side, so here it will give the innervation for oculomotor nerve for the medial rectus muscles to be here like relax so the opposite okay and this mm -hmm. abduce this is the here the abducent nucleus it will give the lateral rectus muscles to make the here abduction movement and when we talk about the abduction is the opposite but here just i want here to explain how is the connection when there is interruption in the medial longitudinal fasciculus at this size in the right side what will happen here this is interruption so here the abducent, here we want adduction of the right eye so here the medial longitudinal fasciculus there is disruption in the oculomotor nerve it will not give the adduction of this right eye so there is no movement in the adduction and this medial longitudinal fasciculus is attached with the paramutin particular formation of the other eye that is re responsible to give the abduction movement. The abduction movement mostly it's occur due to the second nerve nucleus, but this is when the medial longitudinal fasciculus is disrupted here, there is two things. There is limitation in abduction of the right eye, okay? And there is abduction nystagmus in the other eye. Mm -hmm. And what? This disease we call it abduction nystagmus in the left eye. Okay, this is we call it I in O. I in O, internuclear ophthalmoplegia with the medial longitudinal fasciculus, it will be affected. And always at the side of medial longitudinal fasciculus affected, the abduction it will be affected. So there is no abduction of the right eye here. And if it's here in the left eye, it's affected the medial longitudinal fasciculus. There is no abduction of the medial rectus at this side. This is I and O. Okay, I hope it's okay. So let us come back to the pathophysiology. So here, the main problem in the supranuclear palsy, the efferent tracts of upgaze leave the rostral interstitial nucleus of MLF. So MLF, when we said MLF, it's responsible for horizontal gaze, but when we said vertical gaze, there is two nucleus for the vertical gaze. Number one, rostral interstitial nucleus of MLF. Number two, the interstitial of Kajal. This is interstitial of Kajal. And number three is the posterior commissure. So these are posterior commissure. These are the three nucleus responsible for the vertical gaze. So when there is exactly the main point, there is interruption between the rostral interstitial nucleus of MLF and the oculomotor nucleus interrupted the third nerve. Here, the supranuclear palsy is okay. So here, just they explain the physiology. Cross the midline in the posterior commissure. Posterior commissure mostly for connection. It will make like connection between the two sides. Okay, this is the rule of posterior commissure. Course it through the pretectum and enter the superior rectus subnucleus of the oculomotor nucleus that leave the subnucleus and the cross the midline again. As a result of this double desiccation, deca uh, deca the superior rectus receive innervation from the ipsilateral rostral interstitial nucleus of the MLF, also with, from the contralateral pretectum and superior rectus sub subnucleus. So it takes the innervation from two parts. In the monocular elevation deficiency, where is the problem? Uh, is my voice clear? No, it's now it's fine, but a few yes. seconds ago, in monocular, it disappeared. Yeah, it, so the superior rectus muscle it have two innervation. Number one, receive innervation from the ipsilateral of rostral interstitial subnucleus of MLF, so ipsilateral rostral interstitial nucleus of MLF. This is the first one for innervation of the superior rectus. Number two is the contralateral pretectum of the superior rectus subnucleus. So from contralateral pretectum, okay, of the superior rectus subnucleus. 
In the case of supranuclear palsy, what's happened in the supranuclear input? There is here from the rostral interstitial nucleus of the MLF fasciculus into the third nerve is interruption. So there, because this is why when we said above midline, it's not work because here not the two innervation, it will be affected. Just one of the two innervation, it's affected, uh, affected that come from between the rostral interstitial nucleus of the MLF into the third degree of nucleus. Here there is a problem. This is why the horizontal gaze is still intact below the midline. So there is supranuclear deficiency effect, just the up gaze and causing the deficient in elevation. Okay, this is in a simple way. There is big book about this topic, talk more in detail, but I hope I try to make it clear as much as I can. So yes, Saina, read the path of the surgery from here, please. In case of supranuclear meat, it is presumed that supranuclear input from the rostral interstitial nucleus of the medial longitudinal fasciculus into third cranial nerve nucleus is interrupted. Supranuclear deficiency affects algae, therefore causing deficient elevation. Okay, now let us look at the, the picture here. No voluntary elevation of the left eye above the horizontal. Okay, so. So here, this is the left eye. This is in the primary position. It can't look mm. up. Here in abduction, can't look up. In an abduction, also, it can't look upward. In the second picture here, there is hypotrophy of the left eye across the horizontal field of gas. You can see the position here less than this eye. Also here and also here. Hypotrope of the left eye across the horizontal eye. So you can see it's a little bit less than the right eye as mm -hmm. the hypotrope. Okay, this in the primary position, this is the most one clear more than the other. You can see the hypotrope here. And here there is depression of the left eye is unaffected. So the depression movement, it's normal. Normal depression. Here you can see the left doses. Okay, you can see the left eye tosses of the left upper eyelid during fixation with the right eye. So with its fixation with the right eye, there is here tosses, secondary over elevation of the right eye during fixation with the left eye. If you told him to fixate with this eye, this eye it go up because he tried to elevate this eye during fixation because it's like hypotropic. So he tried to elevate the eye and he try also to elevate the lid. Okay, so this is why you mm -hmm. see secondary elevation and always the secondary deviation. This is the rule, secondary deviation. We will talk about primary and secondary deviation in Kansky. Secondary deviation more than primary deviation. This is a rule. This rule, you should remember it. This is the primary deviation, the problem in this eye. It's secondary deviation that occur during compensatory mechanism. Why the secondary deviation? It's more than a primary deviation because of hearing low. What is hearing low? This is very important, low. Hearing low, this is very common question actually in oral exam, always they ask about what is hearing low. It's bilateral, simultaneous innervation mm -hmm. of both eye in the same time. Bilateral, simultaneous innervation, and it's equal innervation. So when there is here a problem, so the doing her low, there is innervation here and there is innervation here. So it gives more innervation here to elevate the eye and also it gives more innervation the same, bilateral simultaneous innervation. Mm -hmm. So here there is like one, two, three, four, there is one, two, three, four pulse of innervation in the same eye. So this eye go more up, more up, it's normal, but here there is restricted in the inferior rectus. So here the brain it, or the nerve, it gives more, more pulsy or sorry, more pulses to elevate the eye and also it's bilateral simultaneous innervation. So more pulses to elevate this eye. This is why the secondary deviation always more than a primary deviation. Here you can see the Bell's phenomena. This is the Bell's phenomena. You tell the patient to close the eye and you try to open it with your finger. You try to open it forcefully. So here I see the right eye, the eye it's go below the upper eyelid, okay? With left eye uh, elevating above the horizontal and forced eyelid closure here, 
the Bell's phenomena you can see here it's totally intact here it's poor Bell's phenomena poor Bell's phenomena not all of the eye go under the upper eyelid like this eye this is intact mm -hmm. this is poor Bell's phenomena you should do this Bell's phenomena for each patient okay let us now read the signs in detail then we will go for the management yes please Ptosis, pseudoptosis. Ptosis can be associated with hypertrophia because of fascial attachment between the levator palpebra superioris and superior rectus muscle. Strabismus. There is hypertrophia of the affected eye when the unaffected eye is fixing and hypertrophia of the contralateral eye when fixating with the affected eye. Yeah, I think this is very clear. Due to strabismus, but let us explain doses and pseudotosis. First of all, we differentiate between both of them by cover and cover test. Mm -hmm. Doses associated with hypotropia. Why the hypotropia? This is the cause, and this is a question come before. There is facial attachment between the levator palpebral superioris and the superior rectus muscle. So the levator palpebral superioris, this is the muscle that will make elevation in the upper eyelid and with the superior rectus there is some attachment between these two muscles in, in, in some part so when there is there is dose uh, sorry when there is hypotropia the eye it go down okay and the superior rectus muscle it's not work so due to, so superior rectus muscle it will move a little bit like this so the, the superior levator papillary superior so due to this attachment it will take the eyelid with it downward just imagine it like this. There is attachment between the two muscles, so any movement of the hypotropia, it will take these fibers of the levator papillary superioris that elevate the eyelid with it downward, so there is doses. The strabismus, we said about hypotropia. So according to the strabismus, there is hypotropia of the affected eye, as we show in the previous picture. Uh, when the unaffected eye is fixing and hypertrophy of the contralateral eye when fixating with the affected eye. Okay, as we mentioned here in the in the this picture, here this eye is fixating and it's unaffected, there is hypotropia here. But when the affected eye is fixation, there is hypertrophy as secondary deviation here. Okay, this is about the strabismus. Okay. Yes, please continue. Both phenomenon. The phenomenon is typically absent in cases of inferior rectus restriction and superior rectus palsy, but is usually present in cases of meat resulting from supranuclear defects. Amblyopia, asymmetric vision may be present if there is a constant deviation of affected eye, ptosis, or anisometropia. So both phenomena is normal in all of uh, sorry, it's poor or absent in all of the cases except uh, in the supranuclear palsy, it's normal. Okay, amblyopia due to anisometropia, the difference between refraction of the two eyes due to the doses, maybe they will have amblyopia or due to the constant deviation. All of these are causes of the amblyopia. Sorry for interruption, there is misconnection in my internet. So as I said, the amblyopia, uh, there is constant deviation of the affected eye. So strabismus, ptosis, or anisometropia, these are three causes here to the amblyopia. Then we will talk about the abnormal head posture. So as we said, there is shin elevation because the eye is not go up. So the head it, or the shin, it will go up. So here, if when ocular fusion is present, you will see uh, there is shin elevation. So the, the compensatory mechanism of the shin, it, the role of it, it, it will lead to pin ocular fusion. The patient, he will make fusion of the two picture. This is the main point of the shin elevation. The saccadic movement, as we mentioned before, upward saccadic are slow in cases of severe rectus palsy but it's absent above midline in the supranuclear pulse and it's intact, but it stopped suddenly 
or abruptly in the inferior rectus restriction. I think it's very clear here. Okay, what is the diagnostic procedures? We have here dimension three diagnostic test. Number one, forced action test and active or forced generation test. What is the difference between forced generation test and forced action test? This is a, a Oski Viva question actually it come in the exam. The force action test, as we mentioned, it's a passive test. What does that mean, passive? Passive, that means you will make the movement. The operator, he will make the movement. You catch two forceps, and with these two forceps, you move the eye up and down, right and left. But the force generation test, it's active. Active, that means you tell the patient to move the movement. So it's under local anesthesia. You give him this eye drops. Then you catch the muscles with forceps. Sorry, you catch the eye with forceps. So you are steadiness or stabilize the eye. And you tell the patient to make the movement, to make an active movement. Please look up, look down, look right, look left. This is force generation test. So the patient, he activate. This is an active test. He moved the eye. And you see the resistance where you see how much he can resist your stabilization of the eye so with your forceps you stabilize the eye and the patient to try to make a force against your stabilization of the eye so this is the first generation test in some books as i read sometimes it will help you to differentiate between like uh, between, between the types of the monoocular elevation deficiency in other book, they said, no, the force action test, it's more diagnostic. But always we depend on the force action test. Okay? So like when there is mm -hmm. superior rectus palsy, there is no any movement upward when you tell the patient, look upward. And uh, when there is like deficiency in the, in the, in the innervation, you will see maybe a little movement, okay? But when it's total, we'll mm -hmm. see there is no any movement. Worth for dot test, it will help you to see where is the suppression, okay? And we will talk about it in detail uh, in CASCI during our strabismus chapter explanation. Let us go to the management. I don't want to make it very long uh, lecture, so please read from the management here. Uh, management of it includes both non-surgical and surgical components. Non-surgical management, it is important to correct any underlying refractive error and treat amblyopia. So here you give him glasses, you give, you make patching for amblyopia and all of these things. But the most important thing we should, we should focus about the surgical. And what is the indication of surgical? The goal of surgery to improve the position of the affected eye in primary case and to increase the binocular field of vision. This is the most important thing about the management. The indication of surgery, these are very important. Can you read them, please? There's significant vertical elevation in primary case, significant abnormal head posture, Deviation induced amblyopia, diplopia in primary grace, restricted binocular fit. So, any problem in the primary case, the eye is not, or in the primary case, it's not orthophobia, and there is hypotropia, severe hypotropia here, mm -hmm. we should go for surgery. If there is abnormal head posture due to the shin elevation, the eye, it's like this. You will have problem in your muscles, in your neck, and all of these things. So here it's an indication. If there is amblyopia due to severe ptosis, and the ptosis especially, it covers the visual axis. So when it covers the visual axis, the ptosis here, this is an indication for surgery. If the patient, he complain of double vision, if there is restricted of the fields. These are the indication of the surgery. Yes, please continue. The surgery of choice in the management depends on results of the forced action test. 
in patients with a positive force reduction test, inferior rectus recession is the first choice of management if there is no restriction. Transposition of the medial and lateral rectus muscle to the superior rectus muscle can be performed. NAP procedure. Okay, so this is very important. So here you make force reduction test. The eye, it's elevated or not elevated. Uh, if the eye it's not elevated, that means there is restriction in the inferior rectus mostly. Mm -hmm. So the first all we make recession of the inferior rectus muscle, and this recession you release all of the fibrosis around the muscle. You release all of the tendon about the muscle. Then you make your recession. Recession means weakening of the inferior rectus. If the inferior rectus the eye it go up with the force action test, and there is no any problem in the inferior rectus, there is no restriction movement. So here there is maybe superior rectus palsy or supranuclear palsy. So here we go for NAB procedure. What is NAB procedure? It's very beautiful. We will talk about the detail now about what is NAB, what is modified NAB, what is augmented NAB. Here this is the medial or and the lateral rectus. And you move the, med the medial rectus muscles and the superior rectus muscle, the, the lateral rectus muscle toward the superior rectus muscles this will make it will change the force movement of these two muscles to the upward movement okay so this they are helping the severe rectus muscles let us see some picture and understand so this is the nab procedures here you can see the medial rectus muscles we take it from here and the lateral rectus muscles and we change the direction of the lateral and rectus and where we put it here at the side of the insertion of the superior rectus muscle so beside the medial part of the insertion of the superior rectus and the lateral part of the severe rectus so when there is no restriction in the force action test we will go for another procedure most of the cases that i saw them in the strabismus and uh, in our department of pediatric, most of them, they have a tear rectus restriction and we go for the recession, then we rejudge again or we uh, make our uh, plan for surgery after we make the recession of the inferior rectus. Because sometimes they need the monocular revision deficiency from one to three procedure. And you should explain this for the family and parents. Okay, please continue reading. Next procedure, uh, the medial and lateral rectus muscles are transposed to the insertion of the superior rectus muscle. In NEPS own study, the procedure showed marked variability correcting 21 to 55 PD uh, hypertrophia. Okay, so just as we mentioned, transposition of the me medial and lateral rectus. Here there is different, different differentiation between the reference here. They said it may be corrected from 21 to 55 with present diopter, average 38, but mostly less than that, not 38, of the hypotropia. So how much we can depend, and, uh, depend on the case, but not exactly the number. There is difference between the number. There is modification of NAB procedures. Also, there is reverse NAB procedure. What is reverse NAB procedure before we go to the modification? As we said, NAB procedures, you remove the medial and lateral rectus upwards. Reverse NAB procedures, you remove the medial and lateral rectus downward. Okay, so if we remove the medial and lateral rectus downward to help the inferior rectus muscles, this is reverse NAB procedures. Okay? Mm -hmm. well, continue the modification of NAB, please. For cases with an associated horizontal deviation, a partial tendon NAB procedure has been described. In this procedure, the superior halves of the equally divided horizontal muscles are placed near the superior rectal muscle insertion, which allows for correction of the horizontal deviation with the inferior halves. Yeah, yeah, this is the point. So modification NAB procedures here, this is this is the picture of it. This is NAB. NAB, you remove all of the muscle of the lateral rectus and all of the medial rectus. 
sometimes these patients they have like horizontal squint not just hypotropia they have another problem of horizontal squinting so they have they need the movement of the median and the director so if you move all of the muscle maybe you will disturb the horizontal squint so here they make modification of the navel procedure you don't need all of the muscle you can take half tendon of the muscles or the, the, the one billy of the muscle here it's like it's two billy so one billy of the muscle you transpose it the other billy still attached and one billy of the muscle you transpose it this is modification of navel procedure so again here a partial look partial tendon nerve procedure has been described partial part of the muscle the superior half so you will take half of the muscle the superior half of the muscle you transpose it upward the inferior half of the muscle is still attached okay so you divide it equally to two halves and are replaced near to the severe rectus muscle. This is, we call it modified nap procedure. Okay, when we go for modified nap procedure, if there is association with horizontal deviation, it's not just vertical deviation, there is monocular elevation deficiency. So sometimes monocular elevation deficiency is associated with XT, exotropia. Okay, sometimes associated with other type of horizontal deviation. Okay, so not just monocular elevation deficiency alone, sometimes it comes with exotropia or another mm -hmm. type of resistant deviation. So here you can go for modification of NAVA procedure or modified NAVA procedure. Okay. What is the augmented NAVA procedure? We talk about NAP and we talk about modified NAP and we talk about reverse NAP. Reverse NAP now, augmented NAP. So NAB procedures, there is four of them. NAB, the original NAB, you remove all of the muscle. Modified NAB, half of the, 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 the muscle, you move it upward. Half of the uh, billy, okay, you divide it into two halves, superior and inferior. Reverse NAB for the inferior rectus palsy, this is very rare. Augmented nap, yes, please read the augmented nap procedure. Utilize nap's procedure combines with posterior fixation sutures on the horizontal recti to increase its effect. By a nylon suture, 8 mm posterior to insertion of the superior rectus, fixing 25% of the belly of each transposed muscle adjacent to superior rectus. Yeah, augmented that you want to increase the effective of the NAB procedure. So what you did here, this is mm -hmm. the augmented NAB. You, re you remove the two muscles. Then 8 millimeter from the insertion of the severe rectus, you go back 8 millimeter. Okay, and with 8 millimeter part of this billy you go with the suture of thin nylon and you attach this billy with this with a stitch and another you go back eight millimeter from here another stitch you make you connect the superior rectus with the media rectus and the lateral rectus with a nylon thin o0 eight millimeter from the insertion to increase the effectiveness of the movement of the upward movement okay so this is augmented now just again, so why we use it to increase the effect? And what mm -hmm. you did by nylon suture, eight millimeter posterior to the insertion of the muscle. Okay, how much you take from the belly? You take twenty five percent. So here, twenty five percent of the belly of the transport muscle adjacent to severe rectus. So how much? You told me how I can imagine. You can imagine there is twenty five percent of the fibers you connected them there and 25% from the medial rectus connected, you stitch them there. This is to increase the effectiveness of the NAP procedure. The last procedure that we will talk about it, it's the modified Nishada procedure. So Nishada procedure, it's a new procedure. We have Nishada and we have modified Nishada. Nishada, we use it for lateral rectus muscle palsy. 
So we use it for sixth near palsy, where we use Nishada, Nishada for sixth near palsy. Okay, modified Nishada, they make it modified Nishada, they use it for monocular elevation deficiency. Let us read about modified Nishada, please. But from the horizontal muscles through the upper uh, third and then millimeter behind the insertion. The second bias shows the sclera 12 millimeter behind the limbus in the superior temporal and superior nasal quadrant, midway between the superior rectus and the horizontal rectus muscle. It will transpose the horizontal rectus forces superiorly. Yeah, this is a very nice procedure. So here, the modified nishada. First of all, I will talk what is nishada. Nishada, when there is abdus at near palsy, like here, the lateral rectus muscles, it will not work due to abdus at near palsy. So the inferior rectus uh, muscle and the superior rectus muscles, they take part, okay, mostly third of the muscles. Okay, you take a third of the muscles with a stitch and this third of the muscle of with a stitch you go to a midway between the lateral rectus and the superior rectus and you put the stitch here in the sclera midway between the two muscles okay 12 millimeter from the limbus here this is the eye you measure 12 millimeter from the limbus and midway between the two muscle you make the stitch here and another stitch from the third of the belly of the muscles and midway between the lateral rectus and the inferior rectus, okay, you put a stitch here in the sclera, 12 millimeter from the limbus. This is the Nishada procedure. Okay, why we go for Nishada and we define Nishida? Okay, mostly when we work at the muscle it itself and in the monocular elevation deficiency, Mostly if we want to work if in the inferior rectus recession, okay, then we will do navy procedure, remove these two muscles. So here we will work about three muscles. And when there is when we are working at three muscles, there is high increased risk of ischemia, anterior segment mm -hmm. ischemia. And this is very big problem. So when you work at the three muscles or more in one eye, there is high risk of anterior segment ischemia. Because if if we go to the anatomy, each muscle it have mostly two anterior ciliary artery, two anterior ciliary artery, except the lateral rectus, it have one anterior ciliary yeah. artery. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have mostly seven anterior ciliary artery, and when you seven anterior ciliary artery. Okay, and we will work at the three muscles, you will make a skin. So, modified Nish uh, Nishida procedure, let us go to the picture, it will be much easy for you. So, here you will not take the muscle, you enter the stitches in one third, okay, of the muscle, and one third of the muscle here, you go for an area between two here, this is the point, mid. You have the area, you divide this area into two halves, so the point between the two uh, midway, okay, the half of these two points, okay, 12 millimeter from the limbus, you put your stitcher here. This is how you can transpose the forces of the lateral rectus and the medial rectus toward upward without anterior segment ischemia and you can do also inferior rectus recession okay so this is after the procedure this is how it look look how you remove the belly to here and you remove third of the belly or you remove you transpose the forces to upward this will help the severe rectus okay this is in a simple way i hope it's clear i try my best to make it clear as much as i can so Contralateral severe rectus recession. This is another choice if if there is a still monocular elevation deficiency, and the eye here is hypertrophia, and this eye it's hypertrophia. So we can go for superior rectus recession of the hypertrophia eye for the other eye, the normal eye, 
to make it at the same level of the side. Okay. Contralateral spherectus dissection may be an option in patients with residual hypotropia. If there is still residual hypotropia after inferior rectus recession, you can go for contralateral spherectus recession. Make it weakening to decrease the, high, uh, the hypertropia. Doses can be addressed after vertical deviation has been corrected to ensure that pseudodosis element has been eliminated. The last thing always you will do the eyelid surgery. So what is the rule? Always the rule, do the orbital surgery, then the muscle surgery, then the eyelid surgery. If there is any trauma or any problem, always start with orbit, then the muscle, the last thing, the eyelid. And after we did the procedures of the muscle, we should wait from three to six months before we go for the ptosis treatment. If it's pseudotosis, after you make the procedures and you uh, elevate the problem, the pseudotosis, it will disappear. But if it's a true tosis, it will lead to a tosis surgery later on. And thank you so much all. I hope it's a clear lecture. I hope that I make the monocular elevation deficiency much easier for all of the students. Please, if you like the content, make share for all of the residents in ophthalmology in all over the world and make subscribe and like and thank you. Okay, so just there is a question. I will answer it now. Uh, here, this is slide we missed it before. Modified Nishida, uh, it's described mostly for the abducent nerve palsy and can be here, they mentioned corrected up to 30 present diopter of the vertical deviation with low risk of the anterior segment ischemia. So the main board is low risk of anterior segment ischemia. Uh, if, we, uh, if we use it with inferior rectus recession, okay, it will correct 40 prism diopter, but without inferior rectus recession, it will correct 30 prism diopter of the hypotropia. The question was when I should go for Nishada, when I should go for NAPI procedures, when I should go... So it depends on, on many factors. Number one, how much the hypotropia, okay, the present diopter of the hypotropia. What is the cause? It's inferior rectus restriction or severe rectus palsy. And what is the rule of management? I will go for NAVI procedures with inferior rectus recession or inferior rectus recession with Nishada. Just in a simple way, if you want to work at three muscles, okay, in the same procedure, so here, the preferred option to prevent the anterior segment ischemia to do uh, inferior rectus recessions with modified Nishada procedure. So here the risk of the anterior segment ischemia it will be low. If you want to go for NAVI procedures, you go for inferior rectus recession, and then you assess the patient after one month, two to three months, then you measure the angle again, how much the angle how much the deficit, then you can go for NAPI procedures. Uh, so there is a lot of rule, a lot of references, but it depends mostly how much the prism diopter and how much I, I need to correct. There is a big table about this uh, detail, okay? Many professors and many people, they still argue about it, but we can make it. I can show this table later on, inshallah, and we can discuss it in detail. Uh, do you have any other question? Dr. Sign, is it clear? No, it's clear. Okay, thank you so much.